A century ago, the guns finally fell silent as World War I drew to a close. It defined this country in many ways. Now, thanks to the Vimy Foundation's efforts to collect and colorize images of that era, we've got a fresh view of the Western Front and the Home Front. The book is called They Fought in Color, a new look at Canada's first World War effort. And joining us now to look back 100 years via Skype from Arras, France, Jeremy Diamond, Executive Director of the Vimy Foundation. And here in our studio, two of the contributors to They Fought in Color, actor R.H. Thompson, also producer of the multimedia commemoration project called The World Remembers, and historian Charlotte Gray, author most recently of The Promise of Canada. And Caroline Tolton is here. She is a Vimy Foundation 2018 summer program participant. And even more than that, what did you just win? The 2018 Beaverbrook Vimy Prize. The Beaverbrook Vimy Prize, which means you got to go over there. I did, yes. We're going to hear about that as we go <laughs> along here. All right, let us start as I welcome everybody, first of all, here and overseas. Jeremy, good to have you on the line. Uh, we're going to give an example here of, uh, of really how striking these photos are and how uh, impressively different that is. There's 1915. That's at the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds. These are troops training for battle in front of a crowd, first in black and white, and look how they transition to color. Look at that picture. Look at how more... It's so much more evocative in color. And Jeremy, I want to start with you on that. Uh, where did this notion of colorizing pictures from 100 years ago and more come from, and why'd you do it? Well, thanks for, for having me, and, and hi to the panel. Uh, you know, it's great that Caroline's on the panel because this was a reaction to hearing from students and from teachers, educators, uh, that were still teaching the First World War, but I think that they were uh, just not thrilled about the same way of teaching it year after year. And um, so they came to us and said, you know, we want new ways of, of teaching potentially, you know, an, an old story in a new way. And, and so we took it upon ourselves to try and develop something like that. And we took that famous photo of the uh, the boys cheering after the Battle of Vimy Ridge on the back of the truck, and we sent it off to a, a colorized specialist out in BC and said, you know what, let's see what this looks like. People know this photo, but let's see if it makes a real difference. And when we got it back, we were blown away. Uh, these faces just popped off on screen, almost look 3D in nature, and you can see its expressions, and you can see what, uh, what they were really doing and feeling. Uh, and then we sent a few more after that, and a few more after that, and then before we know it, we have a book and, uh, and a whole new way, again, of looking at an old story. Uh, and we're so thrilled with the way that they came out. It's such a, a great opportunity to talk about these subjects again, but in a new, fresh way. Charlotte, how do you think adding color to these old pictures changes the way we take in this time? Well, I think it actually just, as Jeremy said, it brings the individuals in those pictures to life. I mean, suddenly they're not just people who died 100 years ago in another world where there was no color and that uh, we can't even imagine. They look so like the guys you might see in the gym or the women in the, in the gym or at Starbucks. They're people, they're youngsters, and you realize how the, the grueling experiences they had and you're in the picture yourself because you recognize those faces, those, those, those types, and you think, what must it have been like? Caroline, I wonder if what Jeremy said um, resonates with you in as much as people of your generation, when you see these old pictures in black and white, mm -hmm. and then you see them in color, does it make that big a difference in terms of your appreciation for the time? Yes, for sure. I mean, in history class, one of, the, one of the ways we learn is through textbooks and looking at old black and white photographs, but I think it's something completely different to see them in color. I know when I first saw the book, They Fought in Color, when I got my first copy and I looked through the photos, it, it, it really did bring them to life in a way that, that's hard with black and white photos and black and white um, video. Um, I think it, it humanizes it a lot more. It makes it a lot more personal. And I love the, the title of the book, They Fought in Color, because they really did fight in color, and we're seeing it the more, more of the way they, they would have seen it when they were fighting. You are a publicist's dream. <laughs> you, you've been talking for 30 seconds, and you've already mentioned the book title, what, thri three times? <laughs> Twice or three times? Anyway, well done, well done. Who would have, um, Charlotte, who would have taken these pictures in the first place? Well, some of them are actually pictures uh, that were used for propaganda. They were from the... Um, Department, what is now the Department of National Defense. Some of them, in fact, were illegally taken by the soldiers themselves. They weren't really meant to take photos or have cameras, but many of them did, and they took pictures of their, 
their, their friends. Uh, and then, of course, there were constantly journalists going to the front. There were constantly reporters there. There's a picture of, of the reporters um, being told what a, a glorious battle uh, the soldiers had just fought. And so, in fact, an extraordinary number of the pictures from the First World War show sort of soldiers looking fairly relaxed, a disproportionate number of them. Uh, in fact, given the misery of the conditions they were in. But they came from a lot of different sources. Hmm. R.H. Thompson, we should remind everybody that, you know, we're, 100 years ago, we're a country 50 years old, right? We're a very, very young country. The country's population is a quarter of the size mm -hmm. it is today. 50 years old, but they first arrived 5,000, 10,000 years ago? 50 years old as Canada, right? As the Confederation, uh, yeah. Fine point, absolutely. Uh, and. We, I guess we also, because, you know, your generation may make assumptions, or even my generation may make assumptions that, that Canada independently walked into this war. Uh, no, Britain declared war, and we were in, because we were part of the mothership. What was the state of our armed forces 100 years ago? Well, it's a country that was sort of under the thrall of its parents, uh, in this case, Europe, and in this case, Britain. So... But there were many factions in Canada. There was the pro-Anglo faction who thought we should be more British than the British. And my mother's family are part of that in the West Coast. They still want to be more British than the British. But there was a whole diversity in Canada as well. Some who had no interest in being British, kind of British descendants. And of course, it was French Canada. So it was a multicultural nation that didn't see itself as a multicultural nation. That's interesting. We think multiculturalism started in the 1970s with Pierre Trudeau. No. You're here to tell us no. It started 500 years ago. Let's bring this next picture up. This is, uh, again, one of those iconic images from the war. This was a war about trench warfare and frontline trenches. And Charlotte, in your chapter in the book, you quote a 19-year-old who wrote to his sweetheart saying that trench warfare wasn't hell, it was worse than hell. What were the conditions like in those trenches? They were truly dreadful. And I do not think that um, any young Canadian today would honestly be able to put up with them. Um, they were, these young soldiers were in the trenches for uh, weeks at a time. The trenches were basically the kind of ditches that were being dug back home for sewer pipes. The smell of these trenches was disgusting because there were rotting bodies, there was urine, there was sweat. You could smell the fear. The, um, because of the constant rain, particularly in the early years of the war, uh, they were just full of mud. Harold Innes, the, who went on to become a very prominent historian at the University of Toronto, wrote back to his parents saying, I sleep in mud, I eat mud, I work in mud. The, the image that you get from the letters that these young soldiers were writing home was just awful. And quite apart from that, there were rats as large as cats running up and down, and their clothes were infested with lice. Mm. So that's what it was like. Now, you would have seen these trenches when you were over there. Yeah, yeah. What was your impression? Well, it was quite something, really, because, yeah, they have preserved a lot of the trenches and a lot of the, the shell holes and the craters, too. And it's quite something to walk through the landscape and see it ridden with these giant holes and trenches. And it made it feel definitely a lot more real, a lot more real than it can be in the classroom, um, actually being able to walk through these trenches. It was something. We actually went to um, a giant crater called Loch Nagar Crater, and it was huge, I'd say, maybe maybe half a football field. It was massive, and we walked past it, and it just gives you a sense of kind of scale of such of, of the war. Yeah. One of the things, R.H., about this is, it, for a lot of people, this anniversary will be their first opportunity to consider the events of a century ago. So let's not assume everybody knows what fighting 100 years ago was like. Tell us, what was the warfare like back then? I think Charlotte said it best. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know. I'm not a historian. I don't know. I've read books. So what do you know? You just look at the conditions, you look at the casualties, you look at the fact that a, 
they say that a wound, uh, a bullet coming through your uniform, actually had a great chance of killing you because everything was so infested with bacteria from everything. I mean, the farmers, you know, fertilized the fields with human waste for several centuries, and not only the dead horse and everyone. So it was a catastrophe, depending where you were. I mean, I have letters, some letters from my great uncle Jack, who was euphoric at the fighting in the last hundred years, in the last hundred days, and I have other letters from my great uncle who said, this is the suicide place. He said, I will do anything but go to the front. I'll join the Flying Corps, I'll go to Africa. He, said, he spent some time at the front. He said, that is a suicide place. So depending where you were, and there were places of great activity, and then there were places of absolute chaotic and stupid killing. Right? Because it was a different kind of war. It wasn't anything like the 19th century wars. Uh, suddenly, all the sort of the new kind of armaments, the machine guns, the um, high-velocity rifles, suddenly... Uh, it transformed what had developed from, you know, sort of an old view of professional armies facing into each other and covering masses of territory into these two entrenched, literally, lines of combatants, which weren't fight, fighting. They weren't fighting over much, uh, much land. They just kept going backwards and forwards. And you had to have all these earthworks, practically for the first time, to defend yourself from the new industrial scale of killing. Mm. Just picking up on what uh, Robert said, though, Jeremy, let me bring you in on this. It's not like there weren't any moments of joy. And I gather one of your favorite, if not your favorite picture in the book, and let's bring this picture up. This is a, clearly a, a moment of levity. Uh, well, why don't you tell, pick up the story from there, Jeremy. Why do you like this picture so much? Yeah, I mean, you don't see a lot of photos with soldiers smiling. And then what we found when we were doing this book is that there were more than we ever thought that that there uh, that we would find. And so it was it was interesting to see different faces, but smiling face of war. And I think there's a couple of, of reasons. One is uh, when a camera is put in front of you uh, and you're not in the midst of a battle, um, uh, you know, you smile. You, you smile. Uh, this particular photo where um, three black soldiers, so uh, those faces we don't, um, you know, tend to sort of associate with First World War photos when we're talking about Canada's role uh, in the Great War. Uh, they were in uh, a German trench that was just taken over and they were posing in front of that. So there was that moment of, as you say, levity or, or, uh, or smile or joy, but based on what Charlotte has said and, and Robert and, and what we know, uh, that I'm sure didn't last very long when they were up and had to clean that out, take prisoners and, and move on. So uh, some of these photos capture a moment in time. Uh, and I think that it uh, allows us to tell all kinds of different stories showing different faces throughout the book. And was that picture taken in the town in which you now find yourself tonight? Yeah, just outside of Ras, so it's probably a stone's throw from here or a short bike ride. Yep. And what are you doing over there right now anyway? We are opening up uh, the Vimy Foundation Centennial Park uh, in, in, on Friday, November 9th, uh, where we've repatriated Vimy oaks, um, acorns that fell from an oak tree uh, during the Battle of Vimy Ridge. They were taken home by a First World War soldier, Leslie Miller, to Canada planted in the ground, acorns from those 100-year-old oak trees we brought back to France, and we're putting them in the ground back, right back in the same battlefield that they were collected a century ago. Okay, let's bring up another picture here while you still have the floor, Jeremy. Uh, three people in a very unusual moment. What's going on here? What do you mean? That does, that's a very common war photo. <laughs> no, I don't um, think so. Yeah, you, <laughs> You would not see these types of photos. You wouldn't see any of these photos uh, uh, today. But part of, again, the war experience was more than soldiers in trenches. We're about entertainment. We're about sports. We're things that, in this moment of, uh, of a break and, and quote unquote relaxation, if there was any, uh, between, uh, between battle experience. Uh, and there were, um, uh, there were shows. There were uh, entertainment shows. This is obviously one where men are dressing up in, uh, uh, whether it's drag, whether it's in clown uh, makeup or costumes, as a way of entertaining uh, their comrades in a short part of, uh, of a day or a week where there was opportunity to do so. So uh, we wanted to try and find photos that um, didn't resemble the, uh, the normal common photo that many people see from war. And there's a whole story about sort of that sports and entertainment facet of the war. And it was, uh, it was great to see. Hmm. Caroline, let's bring, we, we mentioned in the introduction that th this was a program that was going to focus on the front and the home front. Mm -hmm. What have you learned or what can you tell us about what 
people back in Canada were doing at the time when the troops were overseas trying to win this thing? Yeah, well, I think the role of the home front is one that often gets overlooked. And the home front was so, so important, especially, well, um, the role of women, for example, is something that often gets so overlooked. Um, women were very involved in the war. They were working in factories, taking over the jobs of men who were off fighting. They were um, raising money for the war, buying victory bonds. They were um, keeping up morale. They were writing back, writing to their, their loved ones who were fighting in the front. Um, so, so there was a huge contribution of, of women during the war. And farmers, for example, um, some of my ancestors were farmers who didn't go off to fight, but they were still um, staying on the home front and providing the food that would be sent over to the front. Um, so people, they, we often tell the story of soldiers who were fighting during the war, but there was, there's a whole other, whole other area that was going on. The war ended exactly 100 years ago and three days from now. And this next picture, uh, RH, maybe I'll ask you, just look at the monitor here and check this one out. Royal Highlanders of Canada leaving Germany for Canadian soil. Um, 60,000 Canadians were killed in this war. 400,000 returned, 172,000 wounded. What kind of Canada would those guys, who look very happy in this picture, why not, they're coming home, what kind of Canada were they coming home to? Uh, I like the kilts. <laughs> I'm amazed at the Baronese. I mean, hello, what are you doing? <laughs> Canada was becoming increasingly divided during the war, and we don't tend not to remember that. The conscription crisis almost split the country up. People were killed in Quebec, put down by soldiers, killed by soldiers in the shooting and the riots. It was coming back to potentially a very divisive nation because we didn't know if we were going to win. There was a lot of people thinking in 1917, this is going to go on for four more years and we might lose. What happens when 400,000 disgruntled guys, like if we lost, come back? 400,000. And, you know, their job in the mine at South Porcupine has been taken by a Polish immigrant, right? The white guy comes back and his job was taken by a Pole. What happens then? So they were trying to, you know, well, we'll take away your right to vote unless you're, who's loyal here? And it became, it was a divisive, there were divisive forces. We're seeing them at play in the United States right now. If you're not loyal enough, you're not a Canadian. How can I discriminate against you? How can I take away your job? How can I take away your right to vote? So the country was under extreme stress, as it were. Thank God we were on the winning side. So those problems drifted away and we were able to tidy things up. But the stake of the country, they didn't know where it was going. And that was part of the dynamite under the conscription mm -hmm. cri the crisis, as it were. Charlotte, 100 years ago, no one would have heard of the letters PTSD, or at least not in that order. But the men coming home, how damaged were they? Many of them were extremely damaged, either physically or psychologically. And there was no provision at all for them. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the First World War and the Second World War, by the Second World War, the government in Ottawa had realized that there had to be provision for returning soldiers, that there had to be housing, there had to be jobs, there had to be money for them to go to university. Because the other aspect of what happened uh, in the First World War was that these guys came home. They were so damaged. How many times have we heard people saying, my grandfather never spoke about it? Mm -hmm. And it, they couldn't process it, and they got no help when they came home because in fact, government propaganda and victory parades meant that people just sort of glossed over the fact of, of the, un, the horrors, the traumas that they'd been through. And the other thing, they came back to a very unsettled country with a rising fear of Bolshevism, of left-wing activity. We had the Winnipeg general strike in 1919. We also had the Spanish flu, which actually killed more people um, than had died in the First World War. Um, in Canada. So uh, there was a, this tremendous insecurity and no support at all for the men who came mm. home. I mean, I know that, in fact, we do have pictures uh, in, in the book. They fought in color. Extraordinary and touching pictures of sort of occupational therapy classes. Uh, but those were the lucky guys. There weren't enough of those classes. There wasn't enough support. When you were over there and you looked at headstone after headstone, graveyard after graveyard. And the people in those graves were not much older than you. Yeah. Some of them younger than you. What'd you think? It was very emotional. 
Um, it's one thing to, to look at all the names and see how many people died in a book when it's just a number, but it's another thing to actually go over there and go to the cemeteries and see all of the graves. Um, it's, really, it's really quite something, and it was something that was very emotional for me, and I think it was emotional for the other participants as well. Um, it, it goes on and on. The, the headstones, there was one um, that I saw that was, it was a boy of 15 years old, and that was really, really something because, I mean, I'm 17 now, two years younger than I am. Um, he would have lied about his age, obviously, to get into right, the service. Right, right. Huh. Yeah, but there were, there were people my age, could have been my classmates, who were over there fighting and who lost their lives. R.H., is there a problem with the way this country remembers past wars? This is a very interesting topic. It's a bit like changing the flag from the Red Ensign to the new Canadian flag. And we remember the flag debate. November the 11th has become rightfully a totally honorable and purposeful day. But it was written back in the 1920s. It was a ceremony based on victory. Losing nations don't do it. It's a very Western ceremony, and I have great respect for it, and we should continue doing it. But how do we say, well, wait a minute, we're a very different country now. Do we remember wars the way we were, we thought we were in 1914, 1918, or do we remember wars the way we are now? Do you remember wars with all the memories of wars, or do you tidy it up and you get rid of the messy stuff? How many wives were beaten by how many veterans came home? How many veterans committed suicide in the 20s and 30s and 40s? How many veterans killed their wives? Does anybody know about that? Because of PTSD. So if we tidy it up and we only tell part of the history, the cleaner part, are we then doing justice to not only how do we remember war, but how do we honor those who went and put their lives on the line, who came back in a mess or came back to that kind of chaos? So I think we need to broaden the idea of how we commemorate. First, because I think we need to be diverse. How do you not? I mean, the World Remembers Project, because we show the names of so many nations, many people have come up to me and said, you know, I've always felt left out on November 11th no, as a Canadian. Just take a second to tell us what that yeah. is, because some people won't know. The World Remembers is, you want to put that shot up now? This is really a striking thing to see. The names of all the dead, yeah. all of them, are reflected on the facades of numerous buildings all over the country. Yeah. And you've got them all. We don't have them all because you have to... Close to getting them all. So we have 16 nations part of this. And the point is, at the center of remembrance for me is the names of those who lost their lives. That's the centerpiece. At times, I feel that's less than important because it's referred to as THEM. And for 99 years, we've remembered THEM. And on the 100th anniversary, I go, you know, I think it's time that we actually name them. Oh, yes, no, their names are on the tombstones, their names... I think we name them, and I think we name them everywhere. Mm. So we are naming them, and then we're telling the families exactly when their family's name will appear. So that family, Peterbrook, can go to Ottawa at 3 o'clock in the morning, because they know at 3.02 their great-great-uncle's name will appear. But the question is, do you only remember the way we were, which we thought was an Anglo-Saxon nation, mm -hmm. or do you remember the way we are now? What do you say to the Czech Canadian? What do you say to the Sikh Canadian? What do you say to the Chinese Canadian? What do you say to the Japanese Canadian? All what of do you whom fought. All who for whom us. fought. And so many people come and say, no, Robert, it's the first time the project, the world remembers, is the first time I've actually felt included on November the 11th. Why? I said, well, I came from Germany as a child in, in 1949. I was young. And November the 11th, I always, I stepped back. And that's true in all the other communities, the Italian communities. So how do you say this country should actually remember as the nation it is now. And that simply means you show all the names. You give respect to the Canadian name, and especially because it's up here in the center, it's up longer. So you say, no, these fought in the Canadian forces. Mm -hmm. But here's the names from Italy, Slovenia, uh, Czech Republic, Britain, France, New Zealand. These are important because we are those communities. So it's trying to broaden the idea of how do we commemorate. But also the other tiny little thread in there, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> is that if you remember in isolation, it has a side effect. And the Germans and French realized this a long time ago. When Mitterrand and Cole went to Verdun and laid a wreath together hand in hand. Holding hands. Holding hands. What an image. Chancellor and president of two nations who had fought horrendous wars yeah. 
in one century. They will, I went to a couple of ceremonies at the Reichstag the, the commemor in, in Berlin, uh, commemoration. The only pictures in the Reichstag were of French soldiers. Hmm. The Belgians will not, will remember everyone killed on their land. That's what they do. Yes, we remember the brave Belgians who were killed, but we remember, I don't care if you were a Turk, a Russian, a Canadian, New Zealand, if you died on our land, we remember you. So it's kind of opening up these ideas to newer ideas. Keep what we have, because it's very respectful. I think two minutes should be two hours, but apart from that, mm. but to put the people at the center of it. Jeremy, let me get you in here uh, on this issue. Uh, it was, I think, about a decade ago that Canada's last surviving World War I veteran, John Babcock from Frontenac County, Ontario, just east of here, that he died. He was 109 years old. Obviously a loss for his family, but in your view, what did we lose as a country with his passing? Well, I spent a day with him about a year before he died uh, in Spokane, Washington, and I talked to him a lot about what life was like 100 years ago. He was the last link, not only to war, but to that generation. Uh, and he remembered life for like what life was like 100 years ago when Laurier was prime minister and what things cost and what he did. Um, but he also told me a lot about what it was like to fake his age and try and get into the service, go for training. And uh, and he was um, deployed just before the war uh, um, ended and luckily sur survived before uh, before much took place towards the last day or so. And I think what he you know talked to me a lot about was that when I go, when he went, um, those stories go with them. And uh, we made a pledge in 1918 as a nation. We said that we would never forget. Uh, and it was, I think, easier to say it then because so many Great War veterans were still alive and we had veterans alive. Um, but now we don't. And I think it is up to generations like ours, generations like Caroline's, to make sure that we walk through the footsteps of history, talk about these things, see these images, and make sure that we never, ever forget the incredible service and sacrifice of this whole generation. Charlotte, when they die, what do we lose? We lose the, um, the, the sense of, you know, the tug of history being in the presence of somebody who has seen the uh, events that we're talking about. Uh, we lose their memories unless we've actually managed to record them on, um, on, on video. Uh, we, we lose the sense, the appreciation of the extraordinary effort that these brave warriors uh, put into um, an, a war that when we look back at the war itself, as opposed to the extraordinary effort required, we think, what was all that about? Hmm. Have you had in your schooling any World War II veterans come to your mm -hmm. class and not tell their stories? To, not to my class, unfortunately. I have had a few opportunities to speak with veterans, though. And every time I do, I think it's such a valuable experience because they, they have the stories. They're the ones who are actually there. Um, and it's hard. Well, what, what, what Jeremy was saying about veterans passing away, it's, it's too bad because they carry those memories of the war with them. But I do think it's so important for us now to carry on that memory. And part of the work I do with the Vimy Foundation is to engage youth and to talk about the war and to carry on and keep talking about um, the world wars. When we <laughs> lose a veteran, we have lost a piece of living history. We have connect, we have, history then moves behind the glass wall. It goes behind the smoke, which is why the colorization is so great. We lose our actual link to that life, as it were, and that's the tragedy in the last, where the, all the World War I veterans died. It's when the next generation, the World War II veterans died. So it's to, to treasure and honor their experiences in their lifetime. We have a long history of loving soldiers when they go and fight for us and forgetting them when they come home. And that's true now with the, the forces who have come back from Afghanistan. How many suicides are going on? Too many. Are we counting the suicides? Is that in the paper? Right? Are we up to 100? Where are we? 153 were killed in Afghanistan. And how many suicides? And are we, as a nation, paying attention to those who came back and they're killing themselves or beating their wives. That's our obligation. And we have, a, we have a terrible habit of loving them when they fight for us and thanks very much when they're done. And that is centuries old, that attitude. And we have to change that, as it were. Jeremy, this might be a moment, actually, to talk about a guy named Sam Sharp, who was a, a member of parliament, who left his job in politics, went off to World War I, came home, as Charlotte said, in 
incredibly damaged condition, was lost to suicide, and for decades there has been a debate about whether or not to honor his service on Parliament Hill, where he made his living, uh, because of the nature of the way he died. They finally did it this week. They put up a plaque to him this week. Sam Sharp, that's a name we should all remember. Aaron O'Toole, the member of Parliament. But how, but, you Sorry, know, how go ahead. He made it happen. Take? Yeah. No, how long did that take? I mean, I think you're, uh, this should be taken as the example of how not to do this. There are suicides. These are the casualties of war post-war. Um, and uh, we need to use that as an indication of uh, something that was done uh, terribly wrong many, many decades later uh, and honor these, the memory of these individuals who come back with these scars. And, and I have talked to many Second World War and Korean War veterans, those from Afghanistan as well. Um, and they often say the reason we didn't talk about our stories for so long is because we didn't know how. We weren't comfortable sharing them. We didn't know what to say or how to answer these questions because it still lived with us for many years. And the ones that I spoke to, of course, are the lucky ones uh, that did not, that were not subjected to suicide and, and, other, uh, and other effects. So I think we take this as an example of something that we can do much better. And I think that lens needs to be um, um, you know, much clearer moving forward, as, as Robert has said. In our brief remaining time here, Charlotte, let me get you on this. You know, World War II was the just war. It was the war that destroyed fascism. It was the war that made the world safe for democracy. You know, we've heard all those stories. World War I, it, it's certainly much more ambiguous what was achieved at the end of the day, right? It was, it, it, it was so pointless, so many deaths for so, for so little reason um, in the grand scheme of things. Does that make trying to educate people and learn the history of the First World War more difficult because it doesn't have that simple black and white narrative? Um, I think it is a, a, a more subtle and complicated story, but it's a different kind of story, and it's still one that can be told and should be told, because it's about the question of sort of why do we enter wars? What are wars about? How much is nationalism responsible for um, uh, the outbreak of wars? I mean, it, there are many reasons why first the war broke out in 1914, but one was the arms race between Germany and Britain. Sort of, there was a sense that um, many of the ordinary soldiers were actually just chess players on the ground, while the generals, uh, who were not exposed to danger, had a lovely time sort of playing, playing around, battling um, the previous, battling their, their, their opponents and sort of playing by the rules of previous wars. Understanding what war is about, why countries enter it, how far uh, there's a gap between the leadership and the ordinary soldiers. How propaganda is used. There are so many lessons to take out of the First World War, which, uh, in fact, I think make it a really intriguing example of um, using a war to educate people into how countries work, how history works, and what we should learn from history to avoid those mistakes again. Jeremy, what would you add to that? Well, I think it's it, what we're finding now. We're talking to young people <coughs> is that a uh, hundred years ago may as well be a thousand years ago, and uh, uh, you know we we have a hard time thinking about what uh, we did and the impact of something that we did uh, a week or two or a month or two ago. So bringing these photos um, sort of in view allows that time to disappear a little bit. So a hundred years ago doesn't actually feel that long ago. Um, I speak to kids of uh, Vimy uh, soldiers, Vimy veterans regularly. So I know somebody and we know people whose fathers and uncles fought. So by one, you know, one generation, it doesn't uh, feel that, uh, uh, that far back. And then when you have some of these photos of people that look the same with people as, uh, as we did, and we talk to people like Caroline and young people about how 16 and 17 years old may seem young, but that was the same age that a lot of these soldiers went off to war, I think that that gap is closed. Um, and I think it becomes a little easier to create some relevancy around these uh, subjects uh, so many years later. We're going to give the last word to our man on the ground in France. That's you, Jeremy Diamond. You are the executive director of the Vimy Foundation. Uh, we thank you for making yourself available to us for this broadcast tonight. And to everybody here in our studio, great R.H. Thompson. Robert Holmes, it's great to have you on our set. Caroline Tolton, congratulations. And you are a tremendous goodwill ambassador for this cause. Good thank for you. you. Keep on thank keeping you. on. And Charlotte Gray, superb historian. We're grateful for all of your participation in our program tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve. Thank you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.